Hi all, um, thank you so much for joining uh, for this session. Uh, we have Heidi uh, with us. Uh, for the few folks uh, who doesn't know Heidi by now, just a small introduction and then we can start this discussion. Um, Heidi is a venture capitalist, corporate director, Stanford lecturer and recovering entrepreneur and more. She co-founded software company, eMaker and served as its CEO for over a decade until its acquisition by Delix Corporation. After a stint as VP of Worldwide Developer Relations at Apple, she became a venture capitalist and now is a part of Silicon Valley uh, based uh, company, Threshold Ventures. Heidi, it's an honor to have you here. Um, we, most of us discovered um, about your career, your journey um, from one of our courses taught by Professor Lewis Martin uh, called Management of Organizations. Um, we really related to your career in case the honesty, clarity, and relatability that we had. And uh, we decided that if we had, if at all we have a chance to speak with you, and this is the time, right? Um, Great. Thank you so much for being here. Just sure, I'll it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Um, before we start the session, ground rules for participants um, for this discussion to have the discussion being smooth. Um, we have muted all of you. We'll have participants on mute. Any questions relating to anything, you can please uh, add it in the chat. We have a few moderators and co-hosts uh, who will be screening the questions and we will ask Heidi about that. We have a hard stop at 9.20. Um, so let's uh, respect time about it. Uh, with that, Heidi, um, just to introduce the profile of the class, we are mostly uh, executive MBA students. We have a few alums and professors as well. We have about six to seven years average work experience, right? Uh, we are in mid-level to senior level positions. Uh, with that being said, we wanted to understand uh, something about network and being uh, having a successful career, right? Um, we wanted to understand how important is it uh, for the choice of place, which is you studied from Stanford and most of your career has been in and around Silicon Valley, right? So the question is, how important is the choice of place that you study and the place that determines success? Is it, is it a very important choice or anyone can be successful by any Well, place? I think, and thank you for having me. And, and I think that, um, you know, when people ask me if they should go to business school, which is always a hard question because, you know, I went, I'm glad I went, but I went a very long time ago. And they ask me if they should go and where they should go. And, and what I always tell them about graduate school is you have to think about three things. When What are the three things you're gaining by going to a school? One is the actual knowledge, right? The learning experience of the curriculum that is taught at that school. One is what I call the pedigree, right? You get to put that name on your resume for the rest of your life and it has weight and it and it's sort of a credential that says I accomplished you know, something I was... Uh, you know, I joke about a lot of these things. It's more about did you get in or not than did you get through. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a rating. It's like a, it's a brand. And then the third thing is the network. And, and of course, the network is determined by the other people who go to that same program. And so I would argue that while I think, I mean, frankly, I think the education you get in many business schools is not that dissimilar from what you could learn if you were an avid user of, of, of uh, online education. Um, it is, you know, the pedigree and the, and the network are the things that, uh, you know, that, that differentiate the schools. And that's not to say that the education isn't also differentiated. I mean, I teach at Stanford now myself. I'd, I'd be silly if I said, well, I think my class is available anywhere. Then again, even me, you know, if you, if you went online and read everything I've ever written and watched every video I've ever done, you probably have a pretty good flavor of what I teach, right? So, um, so I do think it matters. I do think, you know, obviously all of you are at an amazing school and, and I would say that the, big, the biggest thing you need to do is take advantage of that opportunity to get to know the other students. Because I do think it's amazing that even though network is one of the biggest things you get by going to business school, it's interesting that people don't have a, a way of, of building on that, right? That they, they sort of take it, it's an ambient uh, byproduct of their education process and they don't proactively think about, okay, I'm currently in this, in this group. 
how am I going to make sure that I maximize my opportunity to meet other people in this group? I know people, I, I, I know somebody went to Harvard, for example, that methodically said, I am going to take one person to lunch every day from my class for the entire time I'm at the school. And, and you know, obviously they, they didn't even get through all the students doing that, but uh, came up with a list and organized it and, and proactively went to make sure they had a one-on-one -on -one with every person in the program. Now, I don't know if that is necessarily the right way to do it, but I think the takeaway point here is, first of all, not everyone has access to a program like this, right? And I'm not saying you can't be successful without access to a program like this, but I am saying number one is if you're in a program like this, take advantage of it. And number two is don't just hope that it happens, right? Hope is not a strategy. Make a strategy for how you're gonna meet the other people in, in the program. Interesting. Um, so as individuals, we are mostly classified um, uh, by how we are or how we behave or how do we get energies from ex as extroverts and introverts, right? Um, to develop relationships, it could get exhausting for uh, say individuals uh, who are introverts. How, how do you balance energies? How do you actually go about building relationships and networks for mostly individuals who are introverts. It does not come naturally to them. Right. So, so I mean, the first thing I want to do is I want to dispel the myth that either you have it or you don't. And if you don't, you know, you're doomed. And if you're an extrovert, it's awesome. Um, this is a skill you can build. Uh, just like public speaking, just like negotiation, just like, you know, presentation skills. This is a skill you can build. And even me, who people say, oh, she's like the ultimate ex, uh, you know, extrovert. Half an hour before a meeting, I'm sitting in bed, you know, reading, reading a book with my dog and having a glass of wine. I don't want to get up and go to the event either. It takes energy and it is somewhat awkward to go out and meet new people. So, so, take, so do not think that you can't do it. Think everyone's awkward, everyone's human first, and it's a rare individual that walks into some, something feeding off the energy of the unknown. And most people actually seek the comfort of the known. It's, it's our human nature. So one of the things that you can do to make it easier is reduce the amount of unknown. So let me give you an example. Uh, if you're going to an event or you're going to a conference or something like that, if you can get the attendee list ahead of time, you can look through the attendee list. You can decide who are, and, and, and it's not a volume game, by the way. Net, net, I hate the word networking. What I like to think about is building my universe of fellow travelers on the road of life. I prefer that. I actually think that it is more that. Networking to me implies sort of this manipulative using of people to get where you want to go. And that's not how I think about it. I think about building an interesting collection of fellow travelers in my life that then I can call on in the future to share ideas and to help each other and to do that sort of thing. So the first thing is select those fellow travelers. And, and so when you go to a conference, if you can get the attendee list, or for example, in your program, you can probably access all the resumes of the students. You know, link, LinkedIn is the greatest gift to, you know, to, to building a relationship-driven life that there ever was. Find the people that resonate with you. Maybe they're a few years ahead of you on the same career path that you want to have. Maybe they work at a company that you want to work at. Maybe they have an interesting hobby. You know, maybe they share a love of uh, German Shepherd Rescue. I mean, I, I don't know what the criteria are. Maybe they went to the same university that you did. That's another calling card, right? That's another thing that people are more likely to accept an invitation to meet from someone who is an alum of the same program or involved in the same community or nonprofit or or um, religious affiliation or something like that. So pick some people and don't make the mistake of picking the three most important people in the room, because that's what everybody does. If you go to an event like that and, you know, Elon Musk is in the room, everybody wants to meet Elon Musk, right? Pick the, pick the next level, you know, pick the next level of people because they're important people too. And especially, you know, if, if you're picking, you know, people will say to me, well, how come, you know, all these famous people in the tech industry, and one of my answers is because I started in tech when I was 25 and the people I was reaching out to were 26 and 27 and 28, you know, I mean, they weren't, Bill Gates was not famous when I met him, when he had 27 people working for him at Microsoft, right? So, 
Um, I also think that, uh, you know, picking the interesting people of your own demographic, uh, you know, some of those people will be the, the breakout stars and hopefully you will be as well. So, and then I think in terms of an icebreaker, right, you go to an event like this and, and you know, hopefully everybody's wearing name tags and you can go hunt for someone, then it makes it kind of fun, right? You're not walking into a room and trying to meet everyone. There's three people. And when you walk up to them, believe me, an opening line saying, hey, I, you know what? I got to tell you something. I went to this speech once and this woman said that her strategy was she read through the whole attendee list. She picked the three most interesting people to her and then she sought them out to meet them. And you're one of the three I picked. That's a great opening line, right? And I picked you because I picked you because of your love of German Shepherd Rescue. How did you get involved in that? Or I picked you because you and I went to the same school. We even had the same teacher. You know, I asked my teacher about you or something, you know, something. I think that's a great way to, to start. It demystifies this. It gives you a strategy. And I, I find it actually entertaining then, you know, then it is much less um, intimidating to walk into a room of people and think, what the hell do I do next? That's very interesting how to break the ice and get to know the person before. Um, it's quite interesting, Heidi. Um, Heidi, we also wanted to understand while building these relationships, right? It's just not transaction. It's to get to know the other person's story. How do you help and all that. At times when they ask for help and since you get to know them so well, how difficult it is to say no when you know that you can't help them, right? So when right. does the line of network end and friendship start or friendship ends networking? How does it go? Um, how well, there we are two, you've asked me two different questions, right? One is the difference between your network and your friends. And the other one is how to say no. So yeah. let's start with the difference between your network and your friends. Mine is very blurry right? I work with my friends. I make friends of the people I work with. I think about my friends when there's business opportunities. And maybe that's a very Silicon Valley thing. And maybe that's because of the profession in entrepreneurship, where sort of everyone might have a role in what you're doing, regardless of what they do for their living. You know, my, my ex-husband is a surgeon. And believe me, he didn't, he didn't bring home all the people from the OR to hang out on Friday night, right? That was, that was not the nature of that business relationship. But I do believe that, you know, there are ground rules for being, for working with a friend. I have fired friends before. I have fired my own mother in the past. I think that was in the case. I'm not really sure. But anyway, you know, I've, I've hired and fired my own relatives. I've hired and fired my own friends. It's complicated. And, and, and like anything, you have to have a structure and ground rules and you have to have a clear North Star about, about what you're doing. And so that, that dovetails into this idea of no. So I used to have a really hard time saying no. I am a person, I'm a pleaser. I was raised to be a pleaser and of service. And if somebody asks me something, I tend to do it, right? And a um, couple of things about that. So, so the first thing is then I became a venture capitalist. And the job of a venture capitalist is to say no uh, 199 out of every 200 times, right? Because you're investing capital, you need to cast a wide net, and mostly you're going to turn people down. So I had to, as I say, I had to develop a no muscle when, uh, when I learned, right? And what I switched it, uh, you switch in a way from your mental energy of, I used to walk into every meeting saying, what, what can I do to make this a yes, right? Especially when you're an entrepreneur, because you're usually the one asking and trying to get people to say yes. And then I walked into these meetings and I found that that was very overwhelming because I'm also an optimist and I see the good in everything. And I had to think about the overall constraint, which is, if I'm going to only make two investments a year, because if you think about the pace of investing and the kind of fund I'm in, you know, most people like me would do two to three investments a year. Is this one of the two or three? Right. And if, if I can't say yes, it's got to be a no. And understanding that those are the rules of my game and that in that context, it's not personal. When I turn people down, 95% of the deals I turn down, by the way, are because they don't fit our precise stage sector and geography rules. That doesn't mean it's a bad company, right? Someone else can invest in that company, just not me. And so if I make it clear to the entrepreneur that, hey, we don't invest in your sector, like we don't do ad tech. So if somebody sends me an ad tech business, I'll tell them, I'm sorry, but we don't even invest in ad tech. So you can make it very simple, but sometimes it's just, it's not a fit. I'm sorry, it's not a fit. So I think everyone has to get comfortable with the idea of saying no 
and, and exercising that. And think about, can you do it in a way that still feels okay, right? You know, it's just not a fit for me. It's not a fit for our fun. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure what you're doing excites other people, but I don't have enthusiasm for the space, you know, deep, depersonalizing it from the person. Um, I think that, uh, that sometimes people are um, um, users <laughs> and you also have to be careful. I mean, I usually have a rule about if somebody asks me something and they're in my own circle, I'm always going to say yes to the first thing. But if, if I find it's not a good use of my time and then they keep asking me, I'm going to say no. And so get comfortable being able to say no. And I think the last point, and I'll go back to my point about changing from every deal is a potential yes to I'm only going to do two a year. Are you one of my two? Is to think about this idea that time is a very limited, it is a limited resource. And I don't care if you're rich or poor, you got the same amount, right? We, we all have a finite amount of time. And believe me, when you're 63 and you're looking at the road ahead, you have a lot less of that finite time available to you. And so the idea that you set your bit to know your high order bit. And the idea is I'm not doing anything that comes my way. My answer is no, unless I have a compelling reason to do it. So I'll, I'll give you a clue as to whether you have this problem. If you get an email and it says, join us at an event on, and it says the date. And in the back of your mind, as you're clicking open, you're thinking, I hope I have something else to do that day. You always have something else to do that something else is prioritizing yourself and your time and your use of your time. And so it's very important to, you know, I, I, for example, I read a hundred books a year and people ask me, how do you read a hundred books a year? Because I say no to a lot of evening events that I don't want to go to. <laughs> you know, maybe it's the age I'm at and maybe you all like going to evening events, but I don't. And so I just decided at one point in my life that every time I get an invitation to an event, my answer is no unless I have a really important reason to go at this point in my life, the answer is no. So I just would en encourage you all to come up with, you know, what are your rules for the use of your time and then try to stick to them. That's quite interesting. I think a lot of us have this um, hard uh, sense of, you know, we can't say no, we, we generally say yes and then eventually realize that we are not achieving things that we want. Okay, all right. Um, Heidi, so we wanted to understand something around, you know, uh, disagreements, right? Um, uh, in your career, when you built a team maker, uh, there was a point in time where you had a different vision um, uh, versus your brother, right? Um, you stuck to your, you and the company split into two, you stuck to your gut and you went in your own path. How did the disagreement come about some, this thing and, what you had envisioned at that point, uh, did it actually hold through at the end uh, of the cycle of the company? Just wanted to understand that. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, so this is an interesting point. So we're going to cover both uh, startup formation and we're going to cover uh, conflict. So on startup formation, what I think is really interesting is people will start a company together and they'll start, they'll talk about the customer and the product vision and the direction and the competition, all that. And they'll never think to ask the other person, why do you want to do this? How much risk tolerance do you have? Can you go six months without a salary? Are you doing this for the glory? Are you doing this for the title? Are you doing this because you want to be independent? Are you doing this for the money? Uh, how long are you willing to do this? Are you willing to move for this? Are you willing to not have a family for a while? How are you going to prioritize your personal life and your family? These are the most important conversations that startup co-founders can have with each other. And yet you don't have them. I didn't have it with my own brother, right? It never occurred to me that my brother might have different goals than me because after all, we're siblings. Yeah, except we're siblings, we're completely different human beings. We grew up 11 years apart in age under really different family circumstances in a way. So even though we're si siblings, in a funny way, we were as good as strangers when it came to that. So my motivation was I wanted to build a company. I wanted to have people. I wanted to do something with my life. I wanted to see my products out there. I wanted to ship more products. My brother started a company to be the manifestation of his creative goals around programming. And it was, he wasn't that interested in how many users and all that. Yeah, sure, we had to pay the bills, but he was more interested in solving interesting problems for people than actually building the biggest um, market share. And 
those were very different, right? So, so we hit this fundamental thing when I wanted to bring other products and other programmers into the fold and he did it and I was shocked. So point one on, on, on company formation is make sure you understand what your co-founders want to accomplish and even try to role play out what's gonna happen when it gets, gets rough, right? What happens when you have to go six months without a salary? Can you even do that? You know, are you able to? You know, if somebody has a lot of assets or rich parents, they can sometimes do it. If somebody doesn't, they can't. They've got to moonlight on the side or do something to make ends meet. You, you know, the and and again, there's one, it's one thing to talk about what might happen if things get rough. It's another thing to go through it. So, but but don't, you know, so that may not, it may not hold true if, you know, if the shit really hits the fan, but you know, you have to at least have the, you're better off having the conversation than not having the conversation. So the second uh, point is, let's talk about conflict. I am a conflict avoider. Along with being a pleaser, my personality type is I would really like to not have arguments with anybody. Um, but <laughs> that is incompatible with being a CEO and a leader, right? With a CEO and a leader, you have to make tough decisions and you have to uh, you have to execute them. And lots of other times people don't like your decisions, but at the end of the day, you've got to make them. So again, it's a skill I had to develop. It is not my natural mindset. And what I had to come to understand is conflict, hopefully in its, in its best sense, conflict is when um, two people are trying to solve problems and they have different ideas about how to solve them. And I think that if you think about conflict in that way, then you say the person with the different ideas is contributing to my understanding of different ways to solve the problem. And you evaluate those, but then you have to at some point say, but my role is to make a decision and move on and to buy in support. And I can't convince everyone of my, of my way, right? And so again, I go back to this idea of setting rules, right? How much discussion are we gonna have? How collaborative are you going to be? At what point do you draw the line and, and make a decision? Sometimes conflicts can be extremely personal. I mean, I think if there's one takeaway that you, I've served on over, over 40 boards and I've, I've invested, I don't know what, I haven't even added up the amount of money, hundreds of millions of dollars at this point. And what I'll tell you is people are messy and people are people. And most business problems Half of the business problems that will bring a company down have nothing to do with technology or market or whatever. They have to do with people. And so if you, if you understand that and you understand that people are messy, what you want to do is have some clarity around how you, you know, for me, how I treat people. I always treat people with respect. I try to make the right decision. I try to be non-emotional about my decisions. Uh, I try to communicate why I made the decision I made to the extent possible. But I also try to be very firm about, about this is my decision and now we're going to execute on this decision if it is my decision, right? Try to be very clear about who makes the, who's the decision maker, who has input to the decision and, and, and who's affected by the decision and how do you communicate those things to them? But look, there are conflicts. There are, there are people out there in this world who don't like me. There are people in this world who I have fired who will never understood why I fired them, right? I mean, firing people is pretty much the most, on the, on the recipient end of that deal, it's the most um, hardest thing you do in a business environment is to say, I'm firing you, right? I mean, really when I fire someone, what I say is this job is not a fit for you. And that's usually how I come up with why they need to be fired is, is not because they're a bad person. And yes, once in a while, there are bad people out there who do bad things, but for the most part, when you're firing someone, it is either because the business has changed and is going through a challenging time. And unfortunately you only have budget for so many people and you have 15% over that. It's not a personal decision in many ways. It's a decision of what's critical to this company at right this time, who are the people who can do that critical stuff and the rest of the people have to go find something else to do. And it is a sad thing, but it is a business, you know, you can fire 10% now or you can fire 100% six months from now because you ran out of money. So I think a lot of times when you depersonalize it and you let people know that that was the decision, it's not personal. Sometimes it's you're the wrong person for the job. And I, I remember somebody, I had to tell someone they were the wrong person for the job. It was a direct report of mine. And he turned around and he said, well, wait, you're firing me. And I said, well, I'm 
relieving you of the obligation to work in a job that you're not going to be successful at. And he's like, well, that's bullshit. And I said, no, it's actually the truth. The truth is you're very good at 50% of this job and 50% of this job is not in your wheelhouse. And I see you over and over again, hit the wall on this 50%. And I need a hundred percent here. And I think you would be better off finding a job that is a hundred percent responsibility in the things that you really knock it out of the park at, right? There, you know, there are two elements to this job and you're really good at A and you're not very good at B. I think you should go find something that focuses only on A. And so, yes, you're not going to have this job anymore, <laughs> but you know, that's my recommendation to you as a person because I think you can be successful. I think you're very smart and you can be successful, but just not at B. And, and so, you know, I, not, these are not easy decisions, but I think conflict, it's funny because ultimately a couple of years ago, we, uh, my, we did a personality test inside my partnership among the partners. And I, of course, came out as a conflict avoider. And one of my partners looked at me and goes, oh my God, I would never have pegged you as a conflict avoider because you're so proactive about conflict. And I said, well, I'm proactive about conflict because I am a conflict avoider, right? That, that I, have been, I have learned and I have been trained and I've seen through experience that actually, as my ex-husband once said to me when we were going through our divorce, if you don't address little problems, they turn into big problems. Um, I've actually learned through time that, that if you get that weird feeling in your gut that something's wrong and you don't address it, the problem gets worse and the conflict gets worse. And so I lean into conflict, not because I enjoy conflict. It's the opposite. It's because I don't enjoy conflict. I don't like conflict. And therefore I like to diffuse it before it becomes harder. Um, very interesting, uh, Heidi. Heidi, sticking with conflict and moving, um, uh, transitioning to ethics, right? Uh, there was a point in uh, tea makers um, company journey wherein, you know, with a malfunctioning of sprinklers, um, you know, um, you had the choice, like the landlord didn't know about it, employees knew about it, the inventory was soaked or it was not, cannot, could not be used, right? At yeah. that point, it could, it could have been easy to make a choice of, you know, claiming the insurance, but you went against it. Um, of, often we go with an easy decision that could benefit us, right? It's very, very hard to stick to ethics, right? Um, yes. And we give reasons, you know, to uh, do that. So how, how, how did you go about it? What are the, some kind of rules or philosophies that you follow? To stick so to I, the think, hard choice? You know, I think the first thing is everybody needs to understand what their own personal ethics and moral compass are right? Everybody has to understand what am I willing to do and what am I not willing to do to put my business, to get my business ahead. And for me, I don't like to lie, don't like to steal. I like to sleep at night. I like to know that I did a good job. I like to treat people with respect and I don't like to abuse or use people. And uh, to the and I like to make the world a better place, you know, and, and, uh, and that one is a kind of, a, you can throw that away. I think that it's kind of one of those, don't we all want to make the world a better place? But if you're, you know, like our firm, we won't do deals in gambling or porn or things like that because we don't think that makes the world a better place. But then again, we invest in, you know, I could argue if you invest in ad tech, are you making the world a better place? You know, and, and even in my own portfolio, I mean, I have some companies that are very, uh, uh, that I really do think make the world a better place, like cell-based meat company, um, Upside Foods or Planet Labs, the company just went public last week that images the whole earth every day that actually went public as a public benefit corp. You know, we actually have dedicated that, that the public benefit is part of how we will run the company and be judged. But, you know, I also am involved in companies that I can't go to sleep at night and say they're making the world a better place. I mean, I, I, they're good companies and they make people happy, but they're not necessarily saving the world. So saving the world aside, I think that you have to decide. And, and, and I think that the mistake people make is they think that culture are the, are the slogans you write and put up on the signs in the walls at your company. And that's not what culture is. Culture is, is your actions. Culture is your actions. And so the reason we decided, you know, long story short, sprinklers went off. We could have claimed that they destroyed some things and gotten a big payout from the insurance. And we didn't do that. Not because we didn't need the money, but because all our employees watch, your employees watch your leadership 
and they say what's okay to do and not okay to do. Well, if we cheated the insurance company, why wouldn't it also be okay then to cheat on your expense account and charge an expensive hotel or charge your dinners or, or steal office supplies or do all that? Because if we're cheating, then cheating is okay, right? That's the message you send. So to me, being very thoughtful about what is my culture and how do I want to enforce that culture through action, right? It's, you know, I... It, it's very interesting. You, you will all, here's a problem I've faced many times in my career. There will be a top salesperson who we find out committed a cultural error. I'll call it an error. Disg digression, dis di you know, whatever. Sexual harassment or uh, lying about a product or so something that reaches, if it reaches the board, it's usually not just padding your expense account. It's usually something pretty egregious. And my point is, if you have a company culture, but you make exceptions for someone because they're hitting their numbers, yeah, you have a company culture. It's just not the one you, that you're telling people, right? It is, it is the opposite. It is people who meet numbers can do anything they want, right? And, and that is, uh, that is that's, that's not the culture I think you want. So I just encourage you anytime is, again, just like that idea of you sit with your founders and you, and you talk about what you want you know, what is, what are the hard, the hard points, right? Um, I have a funny story. I'll, I'll tell you the story on that. If culture, talking about what kind of culture do we want? Do we accept things? Who makes decisions? How do we listen to feedback? How, what are our borders around that? Having a conversation, right? What's okay? What's not okay? How do we reward good culture? How do we reinforce bad? Do you fire people who, who are, who, who cheat? Well, maybe you get one warning we saw you cheat. We saw you pad your expense account. If you do it again, you're fired. And then you have to follow through. If you don't, again, culture is action. You're setting your cultures. You're setting your culture. So many, many, many years ago, um, a long time ago, probably before many of you were born, I was negotiating a contract with Steve Jobs. And it was really, really long and involved and hard. And at one point, I said to him, my God, that you are the, you're terrible. Like, this is awful. Like, I can't even, I'm so tired of this. Like you think of all these things that aren't going to happen and, you know, whatever. And, and he said, no, 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 I'm just putting it all out up front so that when bad things happen, we don't have to think about how we'll handle them because we've already thought it through. Right. <laughs> so I do think that, you know, that that is important is to to think about, you know, how do you lay this stuff out in advance so that it is part of 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 what you are ahead of time. Thank you for that, Heidi. Um, we have a few audience questions, so uh, we'll go uh, asking about it. Um, Abhishek uh, from our cohort asks, Abhishek, do you want to take it? Sure, thanks, Andrew. So Heidi, I had a very, I know when you when you come for these sessions, there is a set of, there's a pattern to the questions that gets asked, but I actually had a slightly different question. Sure. So they say what goes around comes around. So my question essentially is, tell us about I don't know if you believe in serendipity, but you know, you have a long career. You have career over so many people. So it's about an incident in the road to life. You spoke about road to life where you've helped people and in turn it has turned around and transpired into something better for you. You know, ISB actually talks to all of us about contributing back to the society. So- You know, it happens. I, I'm gonna I want to say something that, that I feel it's one of the, thank you for asking. That's a really interesting question. Um, and it's one of the things I'm a most I'm the most proud of in my life is that I have so much of that in my life that it's almost hard to give you an an exact thing. Um, and so I'll give you one right now. I'm, I'm recruiting student mentors for my program that starts in January. And I sent an email out to my alums to my program. I have about 100 at this point. And, and I was telling my partners yesterday, out of the 100 in the program, and this is, you know, 12 people a year. So some people have been out of the program for almost a decade. 27 of them already emailed me back and agreed to be mentors. And, and when they did, they also usually say something about, you know, I'm doing this right now or I'm doing that. And, and, and a good 10 of them said, I also want to take a moment to tell you how meaningful the program was to me. Right. And because I was in this program, this happened. I met my co-founder through this program. I, you know, I ended up really understanding culture that helped me set my company on the right path or something like that. Now, I keep in touch with a lot of the students. So it isn't that I these are the only contacts I have. But 
you know, every once in a while I'll go and, and give a, I, I just, I joined a board and one of the other VCs on the board turned to me and said, when you were, you know, just starting your company, you spoke in my business school class and, um, and what you said really resonated with me and it kind of changed the trajectory of what I did, you know, or I'll hear from people who say you went out of your way to get, or, or like Akshay, right? You know, we, we talked about um, uh, Akshay right before this session started, who, you know, who ended up coming to Draper University and then he got funded and then he, you know, and he'll, he'll tell me, hey, you know, your advice to me, you know, put me in, in that direction. Now, I am in the very fortunate position of basically my, my job, being a VC, you're placing money, but then you're pretty much trying to help people be successful and give advice and all that. So I have a job that is very much oriented towards helping people, right? Um, but I, but you know, I, I'll give you one more example because it's an it's an interesting one, right? So I, um, I'm a big believer in making sure that my programs are diverse and diversity, and I also understand that role models are very important. It's one of the reasons I get up at seven and 6.30 in my time here and volunteer to come and talk to you guys because I think that it's important for people to see older people who are doing things in a way that they want, might want to aspire to and do similar things. And I particularly think for certain demographics, for women in particular, for me as a woman, as an early pioneer in tech, I think it's important to be a role model for other people. Right now, we don't have a lot of black women tech entrepreneurs and executives, right? And so I was emailing yesterday with Aisha Evans. Aisha is the CEO of Zooks. She's incredibly busy, right? Aisha is a person who is incredibly busy. I don't ask Aisha to do things unless there's huge leverage in it. You know, I might ask her if she'll give a speech to 500 people, but I usually don't ask Aisha for things. Um, but I was on Aisha's board and, and, and she uh, and I have a very good relationship. And so yesterday I asked her, in my program, I also have executive mentors where I ask mentors to mentor students. And I have a rising, wonderful African-American woman in my program, and I asked Aisha to be her mentor. And, and you know, and, and that's an ask for me. And I'm asking Aisha to do something where the leverage is only one person, but it's a very special hand-picked person, right? 90 people applied, applied to my program, I picked 12. One of them is an African-American woman. Aisha had specifically spoken to me in the past how important, you know, she feels that being an African-American woman who's the CEO of a tech company, she recognizes that her footprint and her impact is bigger because it tells other young African-American women that they can accomplish this, even though they look out in the world and they don't see very many of them doing this. And so I, and so Aisha said, yes, because it's me and I asked, but also because I should made the comment when she answered me, she goes, as you know, I'm hugely busy, but I also recognize how important it is to give back. And I knew it was because I made it extremely specific. I sent her this woman's resume. I said, I'm picking her for the very reason you told me, which is there aren't enough African-American women role models. And I think this woman needs you, right? So who knows what the benefit of that will be? Maybe it won't work, but maybe it will. I mean, I know that when I've paired mentors and mentees in the past, sometimes those go on to be great relationships that benefit both, right? It's not all in one direction. It ends up being, um, being very important. But again, I go back to the point of it's my, it is my chosen job and career to be in the midpoint of making those relationships work. And obviously, if that is not your chosen career and profession, you may have less opportunity to do that. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't always be looking for the opportunity to do that. Because I do believe, first of all, even if it never comes back to benefit you personally, you're just helping to make the world a better place. But a lot of times, you know, you know like when I go in, I, I, one time I met with this super senior executive at, um, at uh, Google and I scheduled a meeting with him and I walked in and he said, I've met you before. And it turned out that he had reached out to me and like 15 years earlier, I had met him and gave him some advice or something. I, you know, I, sorry, I didn't remember. And he, and he said, you know, it was really impactful, not only what you said to me, but even the fact that you would take time to meet with me. And it sure changed the nature of the, of the meeting we had, right? I mean, it was, it was, and it was a surprise, cool surprise. I'm sure you did, Heidi, and, and thank you for inspiring all of us. That actually, Heidi, brings me to a follow-up question around women in leadership. And this question is from Shilpi. 
So her question is, with lots of men at the highest point of leadership ladder, what would you advise the woman from your experiences, the problems that can come up and how to tackle them on climbing this ladder? Oh yeah, so hard. I, we, I, we, need, uh, we need 10 hours to cover this topic. I, I guess I would, I would boil it down to a couple things. First of all, you know, I'm a woman, can't hide the fact, that's who I am. And early in my career, it set me apart. It meant I was different, right? If I went to a conference, I once went to a conference, there were a hundred men in the room. I was the only woman. So believe me, I could go up and talk to anyone in that room and they would talk to me, right? If I raised my hand, my question got answered. But the flip side is, you know, I've also been in situations where, where I thought I was having a business meeting with a man and then it turned out it wasn't. And, and some pretty disastrous ones and some, you know, just awkward ones and stuff like that. Um, you know, this is the thing where, where sometimes people accuse me of, of blaming the victim. I'm not, I'm just trying to, you know, I, I would say to people, well, do you lock your doors at night? You know, I lock my doors at night because if the criminal is going to come through my neighborhood, I don't want to be the house they come in. And so, you know, going out and having five drinks with a superior male boss when you're a woman on a Friday night who happens to also be going through a divorce might be a bad idea. You know, maybe you should have a breakfast meeting with that person instead. And, and again, I don't want to single out men are bad and women are good. They're not. I mean, you know, there, there is a very small percentage of humanity who are, who are predators with bad intent. And most of humanity may, means well. And also people make mistakes, right? People, people um, you know, in fact, uh, when you go through sexual harassment training in the United States, at least one of the things you learn that is the very many of sexual harassment cases arise at work parties at which alcohol is consumed. There's a very high correlation between the consumption of alcohol and transgression regarding sexual inappropriate, <laughs> gender inappropriate, whatever you want to call it, behavior. And so if you're, if you're a, you know, if, if you're a young woman and in, you're in a heavily male dominated group, recognizing that maybe some of these types of events are not going to be good ones for you. Now, I also believe that sometimes what that means is you are going to be deprived of the opportunities that create bonding for other people. And, and that's where I think as a leader, you have to find a culture where that's not, you know, very often I've been in places where what they, you know, I, I joke with the people on the boards, so, okay, I don't drink whiskey. I don't play golf. These are not things I'm going to do. Okay. I like wine. I like creative things. Um, I guess I can play poker or I can go race go-karts, but those are not my things. But I find other things to do with people that build relationships. I and mean, one, one of the funny things I do is I have a, um, I, I, I like to work with glass, glass fusing. And I've built a little glass fusing studio in my basement, I mean, in my garage. And uh, I invite people over to do glass with me. And I can, I can, walk anyone through a process in about an hour, an hour and a half to come out with a kind of a decent piece of glass. And I invited a bunch of my partners over, most of whom were male, are male uh, at the time, to do glass. And, uh, and they all had a great time, right? And we did something bonding, but it was in an environment where I set the rules. So again, I, I, think, that, I think that as a woman, and it's better, but it's still not great. The, the other thing I'll, I'll say is, look, if you find yourself in a culture that is bad for you, you can do two things. You can try to change the culture or you can go find a better culture. I'm, I hate, I, in a way, I hate to say this. I wish we could all be warriors who go out there and change cultures. Changing culture is really hard, especially if the leader doesn't want to change. And I would argue you are a resource. You are going to go invest yourself in a place of work. Um, I would strongly encourage you to invest yourself in a place of work where the culture is such that it rewards people of your demographic, because fighting the extra uphill battle of going somewhere where they don't, it's just, it's just, it's like trying to go be successful in a language, in a country where you don't speak the language, you know, you can learn the language, but it's going to take you years to do that. And so I would just encourage all of you, if you get somewhere and there is a cultural headwind to your demographic, you, you should strongly consider going somewhere else. 
Thank you, Heidi. Uh, extremely cognizant of time. You know, we, you have a hard stop in about 14 minutes. So we can probably plug in two more questions, Heidi. Uh, yes. Speaking to the team, uh, and I know I've, I've, we have done some extensive research and you are an advocate of the 20, 40, 60 rule. But sticking to the theme, you can probably just tell us for the rule in, in a minute. But the question is from Hari Krishnan. Most of us tend to overestimate on our weaknesses. But how did you come about to understand what your strengths or weaknesses are and what and what have you done over time? And this I'm asking in conjunction with the 26, 25. Right, right. Okay. So, okay. Wait, I got to write myself a note here. Well, I'll just try to remember. Uh, strengths and weaknesses. So, strengths and weaknesses. There are things I'm good at and there are things I'm bad at. There are things I need to be good at and there are things I don't need to be good at. So for example, uh, believe it or not, even though I used to run a very early spreadsheet company, I'm not very good at building Excel spreadsheets. There's a confession because here's what happened. I didn't need to. And then I became a VC and it turned out that we build a lot of spreadsheets as VCs. And, and guess what I figured out? I can hire someone who can build spreadsheets for me. It's not a needed skill of mine. I can read spreadsheets. I can read analyst reports and spreadsheets and, and SEC forms and all that stuff, but I'm very bad at building them. And I decided I don't need to know how to do that. I need to hire someone to do that. There are, there, I, when I first became a CEO, I was scared to death of public speaking. I'm so much so that the first time I was on a panel, I was shaking and sweating so badly. One of the other people asked me if I was ill. And so, um, you know, I, 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 I figured out if you're going to be a CEO and a leader, you need to get comfortable public speaking. And so I threw myself at every opportunity until I got good at it. So I think, first of all, is, is understanding what career trajectory am I on? What do I need to be good at? And what do I not need to be good at? And how do I go build those skills is an important, is imp is an important thing to do. And I knew I would do this. I would forget the second part. So ask me the question again. Oh yeah. The 20, 40, 60 rule. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so the 20, 40, 60 rule is at 20, you're constantly worrying about what other people think of you. At 40, you decide, I don't give a damn what other people think of me. And at 60, you come to realize no one is actually thinking of you. So I think we, I call it endless spin cycle. We replay things in our head over and over again. We worry about what people think, what people say. And I, will, I still do it to this day. And 95% of the time, if I actually have the opportunity to re-engage with that person, it turns out it's not on their mind at all, right? And, and so just most people, every person, for almost every person, they themselves are the center of their universe, not you. Like even your mom probably thinks about other stuff more than she thinks about you. So, so stop thinking that you are the center of other people's universes. And Yes, if you say something totally stupid, if you do something wrong, I think if there was an opportunity to correct it, you know, apologize, learn from it and move on, park it, right? But endlessly thinking and, and uh, about something is not going to change it. If, if you're not changing the outcome by thinking about it, right? If you're not improving it or learning or whatever, then just stop doing it. And I just had this a couple of days ago where I was thinking about this person and something that, that I did that I wasn't that happy about. And I'd already talked to the person about it. And then I had another meeting with the person and I thought, you know, I thought for weeks about, is this person thinking about this? Are they mad at me? I just had a meeting with them. It didn't even come up. Like, you know, it's just, and so I had this issue a couple of nights ago, I was thinking about it. And, and here is the thing I thought, right now, as I'm lying in my bed, thinking about the thing I said to this person four days ago, is that person lying in their bed thinking about what I said to them? Like put myself in their shoes. Instead of me thinking about how I felt and I felt bad saying it, right now they're lying in their bed. Are they thinking, Heidi said that four days ago. And it was clear that they are not. Like it was clear to me that in the grand scheme of things they're worrying about in their life, the thing I said is not something they're worrying about right now. And it really helped me let it go right? It really, it really helped me let it go. So I'm not saying you should just go through life disregarding everything you say and not worrying about it. But what I am saying is be, take yourself off the endless loop of self, you know, recrimination and tell yourself, I'm going to learn, I'm going to make amends as, as necessary, if necessary, and I'm going to move on and then disengage the, take the needle off the record as uh, you know, as an ancient metaphor goes. 
Thank you, Adi. And that's actually sound advice for personal lives as well. Okay. <laughs> for sure. Uh, the next question is from Shankar uh, from our from our batch. Uh, he talks about a very important aspect which I want to now touch upon is a mentor-mentee relationship. His question is, in a mentor-mentee relationship, do you need to reach out to a mentor or you are picked by the mentor? You know, as well, both. I mean, I mean, first of all, there are formal things, right? And program, and like I said, like in my class, I pick 12 students, they each get us an alumni mentor and an executive mentor, and I make those pairings. And I am very thoughtful about how I make those pairings, right? And I look at the resumes and I look at the hobbies and I try to come up with matches. And sometimes I get them wrong, but sometimes I get them right. I also allow the mentors to to shop the resumes of the mentees. And I say, does any Give me two or three that particularly resonate with you. And if I think it's a match, I'll match you with them based on their resumes. Although, you know, resumes are a very imperfect view of a person. And very often it's the one line that says, my passion is jazz music at the bottom of the resume that I use to make the match. And it turns out that was the most important thing. Or like, like one of the best matches I made were two people who both had pilot's licenses or one match is two people who both surfed in their spare time. You know, I, it turns out that it that those were the best, some of the best matches I've made. So I think as a men, if you are looking for mentorship, don't sit around and wait for someone to ask you. Pick someone that you, again, that you admire and respect and resonate with and reach out to them and tell them why, right? And I think it's very intimidating if somebody, re like if somebody reaches out to me and says, will you be my mentor? It's a little bit like, will you be my pen pal? I don't know. What have we got to talk about, right? I mean, it feels very... It's a big commitment. It's like asking someone you don't know to marry them or something. I think that the flip side, and like me, you know, I already, I, I teach, I'm on six boards. I don't, you know, that my ability to pick up extra mentees is, is extremely limited at this point in my life, but there are other people who have more capacity. I think that the thing to think about is also, it's, you know, I hate to use the analogy, but it's kind of like, you don't ask someone to marry them before you go on a couple of dates. Like instead of asking someone to be your mentor, ask them, if they would be willing to spend 10 minutes of their time having a Zoom meeting with you to talk about a career decision you're facing. I also think having a topic, like just saying to someone, would you give me career advice? It's, you know, it's like, for those of you, I'm a big reader. I said, great expectations when Miss Havisham says play, you know, like, well, how do I do that? How do I even play in this environment? I think it, it is giving someone a kernel of something to work on, right? I mean, when I get emails from from um, you know, people in my student alumni group or whatever, and they say, I'm facing a decision, you know, I'm I'm making a decision as to whether I join a startup or join Google. Can I pick your brain for 10 minutes on that? That's a much easier topic than could you please give me generic advice about my career? And so I just think that starting small, picking someone and being very clear about your ask. And try to limit the amount of time. I, you know, this is another general piece of advice I give my students that I would give you too. We're all really busy. I'm sure you're really busy. I'm really busy. You have more opportunity than you can take advantage of. Your email box is always full, but so is everybody that you're trying that you're asking favors from. And so instead of optimizing your time when you ask someone for a favor, figure out how to optimize their time. Figure out to make how to make the ask so that it is the smallest increment of time and the easiest in terms of the setup that you can give someone to provide you advice and or whatever it is you want. You know, if you, you know, if somebody wants me to introduce them, one of my former students just emailed me last night. She's like, can you introduce me to these three VCs? I had talked to her a couple of weeks ago about who might be a fit for her firm. And she sent me the the, you know, the pitch deck. And I said, yeah, I can send me three separate emails tailored for those three firms and I'll forward them. But, you know, I'm not going to sit there and compose three emails based on her, her materials, right? I mean, that, that would take me 20 minutes of my time to do a good job where forwarding three emails, being able to say, this is one of my former star students and she rocks, takes three minutes of my time. Plus it allowed her the opportunity to tailor each of those messages to the specific VCs, as opposed to having a generic thing, which is not gonna be as effective. So I, I really think when you're, a summary, when you're asking someone a favor, think about how to optimize their time, not your time. And I think, um, speaking of that, I, I hate to do this, but I think we have to wrap. I yes. can do maybe do one more quick question because I literally have a board meeting starting in four minutes that I've got to go. And I have, I need two minutes to go actually get my board materials. Sure. So, so one minute, last question. What is the one highlight of your expansive career that you would want to give all of us as B-School students 
to remember and build towards? Um, it, it's the combination of the people are people first and so are you. And so I just think that again, recognizing the humanity, we're all humans, we're all imperfect. One of the things I, I, I think I started to say, but didn't finish is I've been on big boards. I've been on small boards. I've been on boards of multi-billion dollar companies. I've been on boards where you know, the whole board is the, also the employee base. People are the same, right? The people running those big, huge corporations are not actually that much better or smarter than you. They just happen to end up in those places. Yes, there are people I have met. I've had the good fortune to work with people like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. And I would argue they are different. Right. There are some people like that that are just that are just way smarter than the rest of us or way whatever they are. There are I have met some very off the charts people, but the vast majority and even they are human. Even they have conflict and loss. I don't know if I would encourage you, like, for example, to read Bill Gates's annual letter. He just came out with it and he talks about his divorce. Right. And he talks about his failure in his marriage and, and you know, kind of the inherent loneliness of the situation. I mean, you know. Even Bill Gates gets divorced and is lonely. So, um, uh, you know, I just encourage you to remember our, we are humans first and we are our jobs second. So, and with that, I'm sorry, I have to go. It was great to talk to you all. Great questions. Thank you very much. Thank and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much, Heidi. And on behalf of Professor Chaudhary, the entire community here at ISB, a big and, you know, heartfelt thank you for speaking with us today. And My best pleasure. Of, best of luck for the board meeting. Bye. That was, a, that was a great session. Thank you for arranging it. It was very impressive. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. I think a lot of credit to Vijay. Vijay has been from our cohort, is, is the one who's been following up with her. So credit where it's due. Thank you, Professor. He's such Thank a such straight talker. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, team. Uh, Abhishek, uh, Vijay. Uh, Ankita, just let's stay back for two minutes. Uh, yeah. We don't have anything else, team. Um, just four of us staying back and concluding what to do next. So anyone can drop off. Thank you. Yeah, let's start off. Uh, 